Hello, and welcome to episode number 135 of A Mic on the Podium, with me, Michael Seal. Before we start, I want to thank my latest Patreon subscriber, Justin, for his support, and all my other Patreon subscribers for their continued support. This podcast would struggle to continue without them, and my Patreon page has become a great place to learn about, and to chat about, all aspects of conducting. There'll be more about my Patreon page later on in this episode. Today, I conduct a conversation with a British conductor who started out as a very successful young composer before switching to conducting. He was the very first conducting scholar at the Berliner Philharmonica Karian Academy, and since 2021, he has been the chief conductor of the South Netherlands Philharmonic. It's a great pleasure to welcome Duncan Ward. Duncan, it's lovely to see you again. I will say again, because the last time we saw each other was backstage at the Cologne Philharmonie, and we'd both gone to see uh, the LPO play Sibelius II under a friend of both of ours, Ed Gardner. So how are you? Are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Great to, great to see you again. Yeah. Um, regular listeners will know that I always do my homework, and I go back to you know your website or Wikipedia or your agent's page, and as far back as I can go is that I know that you studied at Junior Trinity College, piano, horn, composition, and conducting. Now, do you come from a musical family, and which came first, the piano, the horn, the composing, or the conducting? Um, actually, I come absolutely not from a, um, a musical family, quite a large family. I'm one of five, um, and we grew up doing all sorts of uh, sports and uh activities and my my parents had a um a fairly eclectic um uh, lp collection mm. uh that i i took an interest to and uh probably my earliest earliest music experience in actually was was uh moving to it um apart from i suppose um them sometimes singing us to sleep with folk songs and stuff um uh, my my elder sisters always disappeared on a Thursday evening down the road to, to go to the ballet class. And I thought, yeah. well, this is clearly what you have to do. Why am I excluded from this? So yeah. I put my little little blue shorts on. And um, that was probably the, the, the first classical music I was hearing was the, the guy playing the piano in the corner of the ballet room. Yeah. Um, and later this went a bit further with a, um, uh, uh, a budding uh, roller skating career. But I had... Uh, <laughs> oh, I like that. You might be the, my first ever roller skating um, uh, youth. <laughs> was uh, a totally bizarre part of my life, but one I took very seriously. It started when I was four. Yeah. Um, we'd gone to see a pantomime, Peter Pan on roller skates, and I decided that we should all do it. Yeah. And so we did. Um, and uh, so, for instance, I probably, uh, you know, later making a routine for some I took it quite seriously me and my brother were sort of in the British team we went and did European oh, wow. competition stuff and uh doing you know a routine to the firebird or something I, I probably didn't know who Stravinsky was I certainly had never seen the score yeah. uh but you know this felt like good music to skate to yeah. so so that was all that and I suppose my first touch with an instrument was uh, a tiny little electronic keyboard that yeah. one of my older sisters was bought as a random present and I was fascinated with this thing and uh, I spent a lot more time prodding it than anyone else in the family and um, was picking out the tunes I knew picking out the the nursery rhymes the whatever it was um, and immediately starting to compose uh, mm. little fragments you know offering granny a Christmas present or something with a, a, a little a little piece and, and my parents asked if I would like um, uh, to ha maybe have some lessons and we found that at the local primary school um, in my village in, in Longfield uh, there was a, a woman coming in and, and teaching electronic keyboard I mean it was really yeah. that with the, the beat playing and you do the chord in the left hand and um, and, and, and that's where it started and I, I just uh, loved it and it, it eventually progressed to, to piano I remember uh, um, uh, electronic keyboard exam actually I think I went to like grade five on the the, the keyboard exams and mm. you get your sort of 13 minute slot in the room in which you do your scales and then you exercise them and this really nice examiner said um I did smoke gets in your eyes and, and he said 
that was beautiful, Donkey. Can you play that to me again? And I thought, well, this is a bit strange. You know, we'll run over time, you know, okay, but if you yeah. say so. And uh, later he said, well, have you thought about playing the piano um, instead of just the keyboard? And I said, what do you mean just the keyboard? I mean, I don't really fancy the piano because it's only got one noise. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Luckily, I really uh, quickly realised what a twit I was, and yeah. um, and did did progress and learn to make different noises from the piano, mm. uh, and 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 started. I mean, the the the, the woman um, who was getting us to sing hymns in the in the, in the school assemblies, um, was a great singer actually, and really encouraging to us all. But um, not always the best the best pianist, and and she quickly said you know well why don't you play instead you know so I was mm. pressing extra hard some hymns and uh taking over that and it it, it sort of all went rather rather pr progressed quickly because I would just come home from school and practice um mm. and I was particularly into Scott Joplin somehow and um also like early early trad jazz somehow was my thing that I liked um mucking around with and um the game changer really was arriving at my secondary school in in, in Dartford um, and we had a fantastic head of music uh, a guy called Simon Hayward who was a trombonist and he was very encouraging I used to go chat to him at the end of the school day he would send me home with records and things and um, the, the the sort of everything took off um, uh he was encouraging it, i showed him the sort of little compositions i was writing and he would mm -hmm. always try and make me take a step further um for a bigger ensemble or whatever it was and in the summer holiday of that first year at secondary school so i was aged 11 i um i decided i would compose a musical <laughs> uh, and it would be on <laughs> alice in wonderland mm. and um i locked myself away and the songs got gradually more advanced towards um well Bernstein was the idol but it was it was uh, uh somewhere in there a mishmash of all sorts of things I picked up I guess and um I brought the two hours of music score uh to him in September and he, he he had a flick through and he said you know what um this is actually look, looks looks quite interesting um it's the start of term. I'm super busy. I can't do anything with this right now. But if you want to uh, perform it, try it out, you do it, Duncan. Um, and I said, well, okay. And right. I took the school school choir and started the rehearsals and put together orchestra come big band to um, be in the pit, as it were, not that there was a pit, um, and auditioned my academic teachers as the soloists. Wow. Um, and... Off we went, you know, and I had no idea what conducting was. Um, but I thought, well, I, I'm the one that wrote this piece. I better lead it. Yes. Um, and was waving my arms, think, doing what I thought I should do. Um, and in the show was leading from the piano and waving a bit. One of the cellists kindly pointed out that if you're in three in the bar, Duncan, go down and then right and then up and, and not, you know, over, <laughs> not over the, other the left. Way. Yeah. Great tip. I've remembered it ever since. <laughs> and um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I learned, of course, a huge amount from yeah. that just doing it. Um, and, 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 and sort of thought, well, I'm, I'm, I want to keep performing and doing all this, uh, but, you know, as I, as I, as I get older. Was that, do you think now looking back, the moment when, to use Hawk and Hardenberger's phrase, you drunk your first draft of stick poison, or as my <laughs> old mate Pete Hill used to say, you got stickitis. Was that the moment, do you think? Or do you think then, as you just said, it was just music making that, that you were uh, utterly bowled over by? To be honest, the the, the latter. It was, yeah. it was um, wow, I love this shared musical experience yeah um i'm hooked on this this is what i want to spend my life doing mm. um it was still one of many things i was interested in but it, it became extremely important yeah and um yeah i think the sort of the the definite conducting decision you know took another 10 years or something yeah but i was inspired to you know compose more ambitiously to be honest you know, about a week from when it was going to be showtime, I was already saying, 
please can we just cancel it you know i i could write something <laughs> so much better now i've yes. learned so much let's not waste our time with this and you know luckily this same teacher um plus a bit my my, my parents said well oh go on just just do it you know you yeah. might learn something even more from the actual performance which was very true yeah. um he so d- up to that point i'd only played piano and done a bit of composing and and begun to wave my arms um this same teacher very smartly said um we're not going to give you your 50 pounds music scholarship or whatever it was um next year unless you start playing a proper orchestral instrument Mm. um and by the way as we don't have any others at the moment i would suggest the french horn (laughs) <laughs> um, this is often the way with, with people who end up playing the horn, the bassoon, the viola or the double bass. Yeah, through a complete dearth of any people in the school who, you know, yeah, we need one. So it's over to you, Duncan. Yeah, exactly. And mm. looking back, I mean, brilliant choice. Um, mm. It's a phenomenally hard uh, instrument. Um, but I had to learn, um, you know, about breathing I had to learn about attack embouchure all the things of of collective ensemble playing from that perspective of the orchestra um I also you know when I started to be like in junior trinity orchestra for instance to sit there at the back of the orchestra and in the many bars off you have as a horn player look around and see quite what all these other brilliant people were busy Mm. doing Mm. Um, and what the man or woman in front of us waving a stick uh, was doing and when it was extremely helpful and And when when it wasn't, yeah. When it wasn't, you know. I've said it it so often on the podcast, Duncan, uh, you know, you look back and think, I learned a lot from my teachers, but I probably learned equally as much, if not more, from the ones who got it spectacularly wrong uh, in rehearsals or concerts I've been involved with. And, you know, that's just a fact. Yeah, it's it's really true. And especially as a horn player, I mean, I wasn't ever brilliant and um, I could easily uh, split the note or... Frankly, in the new piece, I was sight reading, missed the entry or whatever it was, yeah. you know, and yeah. the the right sort of um, gesture and approach to that, and and the, the you know the people that um, I lost focus in rehearsals or the people that I was totally hooked and you know mm. in it hundred percent. Yeah, it was it was a great um, uh, piece of advice to, to start doing that. So on to undergrad, or as it used to be called, further and higher education. Um, Where did you go and study as an undergrad student? Was it university for you or was it uh, a music college, a conservatoire? For me, it was uh, both. It was the um, attraction of going to Manchester and doing the so-called joint course. Um, So around five, usually each student's. Um, foolishly or not, uh, <laughs> take on being at the Northern and the uni at the same time. Mm. And for me, this was ideal um, yeah. because they are two fantastic institutions, um, both with a great deal to offer. Um, some of my joint course colleagues, um, you know, drove themselves crazy over trying to fulfil the, you know, absolute um criteria of both degrees at once Mm. I treated it more like a sort of deluxe chocolate box which I would pick pick what I needed and what I felt I could get the most out of Mm. Um, I think it's a very similar approach from uh, to uh, Jamie Phillips who I I believe also did uh, the dual degree um, thinking back through the episodes I'm sure he did that and I'm sure he had a similar approach and I'm sure he said a similar thing that he saw people burn themselves to a, you know to the yeah. wick trying to do absolutely everything that both courses needed whereas he just he just did what he wanted or did what he knew would help him in the future um, and I think that's a very wise approach yeah and if you uh, you know if there was really something you um, had to miss or or, or frankly <laughs> 
uh, sometimes, I mean, it was always a good excuse. Oh, I'm in something there or I'm in something there, you know, actually you could <laughs> yeah. be yeah. as, as I sometimes was, uh, even like off in India or something, uh, doing, uh, you know, a charity I was running or, uh, you know, I've, I've got a really nice gig that I've somehow managed to get in Switzerland, you know, and you would just disappear completely, but it could be off radar. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I say that jokingly inside, it was fantastic. Mm. And, um, the, it, I mean, in my first year, I was stuck in with all these threads, frankly. Um, I was accompanying people uh, in their recitals. I was uh, playing the horn in the contemporary music groups, discovering what crazy things people were writing. I was uh, in, in the orchestras. I was um, in the jazz stuff. In the It was sort of an explosion of, of, of stuff. And I'd... The, the composing thing had been the earliest to sort of escalate professionally by that stage. So I did actually have some commissions I needed to do at that point um, and was occasionally doing like a piano concerto with an um, amateur orchestra or something. Mm. So it was, a, it was a really busy time, but it was brilliant. Um, so and so what, what was the chronology of because it's well worth saying, because uh, bravo to you, you were the 2005 winner of the BBC Young Composer of the Year. Was that before you went to Manchester or was that during your time there? That was a few years before. Right, Um, okay. So as a consequence, you were being known as a composer when you went to Manchester. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. exactly, yeah. Um, And was, yeah, quite quite busy somehow with um, pieces to write for for, for brass ensembles, for sometimes for orchestra, for choir, for for, for whatever it was. Um, and so, I mean, again, that was a thing, you know, uh, the, the Royal Northern Composing Department is, is fantastic and they're very good at giving you opportunities to get your pieces played. Mm. Uh, I had a bit the other thing that there was a lot of external stuff already um, and I, I kind of couldn't do the extra stuff that was needed to do to be played there so I was using the lessons there and yeah just just making it work and and using the great professors and whatever they were around and resources to 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 to, to get the most out of it and the conducting thing t- took quite a sort of step upwards I had had some lessons at Junior Trinity from a chap called Andy Morley who um and a bit on from Peter Stark as well when I was in the National Youth Orchestra, um, gave me a great general grounding about yeah. gesture and about um, the the sort of uh, yeah the the basic power of gesture and and basic beat patterns and things. And Andy Morley had a very unique start to his life growing up on a um, travelling fairground. So his analogies <laughs> about uh, you know a, a, a swinging beat with a clear uh, impetus was yeah. about like a roller coaster yeah. or a, um and it, th- this always stuck to me too i mean was 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 a really sort of clear pictorial thing um but at the university um at the end of the first year there was an audition at the at the uh, Manchester uni music society uh for the student led at that time uh symphony orchestra um to pick two conductors for the following year and um I was chosen um, and it meant that from the start of the following year, we could program a few concerts uh, across the course of the academic year, almost with what we wanted uh, to do. Um, And we were both (laughs) ambitious and did, um, I mean, Shostakovich first symphony, I remember, Macmillan, Confession of Isabel Gaudi. And to be honest, the, we didn't have that much rehearsal time, but the, there were some good players, um, and we, uh, we, yeah, I, I really went for it. And I mean, the, the Shostakovich, I remember me- memorizing. I mean, I was determined to, uh, mm. you know, study it all summer and 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 really go for this. Yeah, it was 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 brilliant. And I mean, that alongside conducting on request, composers premieres with the contemporary ensemble and uh, that sort of stuff and to be honest uh, it was then very fast because um, Mark Heron who at that stage was becoming involved in uh, the um, university music activities as well as his sort of work at the Royal Northern 
um, and began a sort of, uh, well, conducting mentorship stuff that really escalated in the time I was there. Mm. But he was the one who, from that Shostakovich, actually said, have you thought about doing this professionally? And I said, well, no, not yet. Yeah, um, yeah. And he said, well, you know, there, there are these um, various masterclasses and stuff you could apply to, um, as well as the competitions or whatever. I knew nothing about all that, but I, he, re- he said a few names and I went home and Googled and um, sent off some some tapes. Um, yeah. I was in my second year, I was 20. And amazingly, um, nearly all of them, of those applications I sent back, came back with a yes. And um, so that summer I had my first experience with a professional orchestra, which was in the masterclass with LSO and uh, Gergiev, mm. and suddenly had to, you know, Rolls Royce at the fingertips to see how they would respond. I went off to Lucerne Festival to um, be one of the few in the in the Boules and um, yeah, yeah. uh, masterclass program. Went off to Chicago Symphony. Um, uh, I, so it was sort of uh, yeah a, a sudden step of um, foot in the water with some great ensembles and um, uh, some yeah n- new mentors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean. Uh, what a great list to you know Gergiev uh, Boulez uh, at that stage of your career plus of course and I'm assuming you know you've already mentioned Mark but of course you know the pairing of Mark and Clark you know yeah. who have both been interviewed on here and their names have been discussed many times in the past because I've interviewed quite a lot of their ex peoples which goes to show how influential they are at least in the UK or have been um you know that's a really good grounding and a, and as you said quick you quickly you know you're rising up and getting really good opportunities at, at at that early stage i mean how long were you there in manchester did you stay and do a post grad or or were things actually really happening that quickly um before we we go to berlin which i suppose is the next big date on my crib sheet down to my left but uh, um you know how long were you there and how much of that mark and clark schooling did you uh, indulge in so it was all a bit um, uh, simultaneous at that stage. Yeah. The sort of um, little professional engagements coming from th- those major masterclass type things yeah. um, alongside still studying. So, uh, I mean, the LSO quite quickly booked me for like a, um, a little gig in St. Luke's with the strings of the orchestra yeah. uh, plus an Indian violinist. And um, this audition in Chicago led to a booking the next summer with a fantastic contemporary ensemble in New York the following summer and the Boulez thing was one of the uh, events that led me to Simon and and, and, and Baron Boehm's attention uh, mm. in Berlin um, but meanwhile I was I was still a student I was still in Manchester and I did my uh, four years there sort of yeah. um, it wasn't ever very uh, full time with with either Marco Clark but they were fantastic uh encouraging um voices i loved the way when i you know when i dipped in on the um conducting class or you know mark elder was in town and i went i loved the way they they weren't pushing any um agenda or style of conducting no no exactly they were looking at what an individual do and Mm -hmm. thinking what would make this more efficient or what could help here? What could make this better? Mm. Um, and, or, you know, uh, in in a practical situation, actually, yeah, okay, great. But you could have just said to the violas here, this, you know, or, or taking it apart in this way. Very practical, real advice about yes. um, yeah. how to, how to get the best from the 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 the, the ensemble in question? Mm. Did I do a masters? Uh, th- there's there's two answers. One <laughs> uh, one is technically yes, but I never got the degree. Right. Um, they there was a situation, very strange situation where, um, uh, I mean, I was already in Berlin. Um, okay. I w- uh, I was already actually signed by Askinus. I was already conducting professionally, but. Um, just before the start of an academic year, the someone dropped out from their um, master's conducting program at the ITM, and it was on full scholarship, and they yeah. couldn't find 
I, I don't know what it was, but they basically said, w uh, would you like to come? We don't expect you to be here very often, but it might still be helpful for you. Um, yeah. You know, just use it, you know. So I didn't walk through the building very often in those years, but um, <laughs> I did the exam with the Manchester Camerata and I didn't do all the, the coursework, actually. So that's why I didn't actually get a degree. But um, yeah. they, they kindly gave me 100 points for the conducting exam. And um, it, I, it, it, it was a, a strange situation. But that's not to degrade the, the influence of their no, no, um, no. Yeah. support. And when I was there in a class, I learned a lot, you know. Yeah. Well, you just mentioned Berlin, and you were uh, the first ever conducting scholar at the Berliner Philharmonica Carian Academy, uh, which meant that, you know, uh, you were, I suppose you had to, you know, basically live in Berlin. The Carian Academy, for those listeners who don't know, is something that's been around a while, and it's almost like a training ground for young musicians um, who are sort of handpicked and then they're, they're taught the ways, like young Padawans of the Berlin Philharmonic. And often you will see, you know, see these people graduate from or do some extra work with the orchestra and then graduate and then join the orchestra. And some of them have gone on quickly to become section principals. I can't remember his name, but the principal cello is one of those I seem to remember seeing. So how did that come about? Um, to, for, I think I remember reading somewhere that it was a, a, a position created. Uh, it, it had never existed before. How did that happen? It had never existed before, and it had never existed before partly because I think after Daniel Harding, but maybe it goes further back, um, at some point the Berlin Philharmonic had, had banned wanting to have uh, official assistant conductors. Right. Um, because in their um, deserved pride, they they wanted to be conducted by the <laughs> actual maestro who was going to do the, uh, yeah, yeah. the, 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 the concert. Um and so Simon had um, had heard about me from various friends, um, either as players in orchestras I'd conducted mm. or through um, someone like Boulez. Um, by that stage, I'd also been invited to um, watch some, some Barenboim rehearsals at the Staatsoper, and he'd thrown me in front of the orchestra once and... Um, uh, he he wanted to study. That was how it worked. He'd wanted to study, uh, or at least see some of my compositions, and so he right. asked for my latest orchestral pieces. And um, when <laughs> Simon was, I think, I think it was Rosen Cavalier who was conducting. It doesn't really matter, but he was using Daniel Barenboim's dressing room um, in the State Opera uh, to uh, conduct whatever opera he was at that yeah. moment. And open on 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 the desk was a, a, a piece by Duncan Ward. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he was having a flick through, and um, thought, okay. And so he picked up the phone to <laughs> Baron Boyman. So, so so who is this? You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, was 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 curious. So I mean, uh, that's also a very unlikely story, but apparently it's true. And um, but it's the joy of this podcast, Duncan, is that every story is different of how people end up doing what we do, and you know. Yeah. Whilst un unlikely it might be and, and almost fanciful, and if it had appeared in a Hollywood film, we'd all go, yeah, get lost, that ain't happening. Uh, but it happened to you, you know, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. It, it happened. And yeah. um, I, so it was great. I mean, it was kind of suggested that I just go out and hang in Berlin for a month and watch some rehearsals that Simon was doing. And um, he'd meantime sourced some videos of me conducting and was, was interested in, and, and sort of, you know, we chatted occasionally. Um, and then I got this call to uh, come and assist on a single project, um, a concert version of uh, Valkyra. Mm. And um, it was that first day. I mean, I'd, I'd rocked up, I'd reported for duty. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I still thought, I, I barely know this man. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, I've hurriedly learned this massive Wagner score. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, great, you're here already. Um I really need you for for balance patrol this week, um, but 
actually, we start this morning with a, a string sectional because, mm. you know, we really need to get it cooking. D don't be shocked that it might be carnage when we start. Um, they get better very quickly. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> take a few in the stalls and, uh, you know, uh, see what you think. And by the, by the break, there was a bit of phrasing um, the way they were, the first violins were playing. Uh, this this passage towards the end of the, the the first act, and I thought, do they really want it to go like that? Um, uh, sure, uh, it was against it was it was bugging me, mm. um, and I thought, is a uh, is it a Boeing thing? Is it? Uh, I'm not a string player, but and I thought, well, pff, they're paying me to be here. I'll go and tell him, mm. um, and um, I I went into the holy conductor's dressing room, and there were goodness knows how many people there to try and see him about whatever and the management were busy discovering this and whatever yeah. and he looked up at me and he said um Duncan is, is something wrong yeah. um and I said well um well sorry to disturb I didn't realize him um but you know that bit you don't you think it should go like this and I sang how I thought and he looked at me and said yeah you're, you're absolutely right no it's not a Boeing thing I'll have to tell them um, and yeah. we'll work on it after the break. And we <laughs> sat back down and he literally did go out and he told them, um, yeah. no, this bit should really go like this. Um, and I thought, Gee, OK, well, whatever. And at the end of that day, um, we sat again and he said, you know, I've been thinking um, maybe you're already busy, maybe you're, you're not interested. But if I were to create, um, you know, like a two year position for you here um might you be interested um, <laughs> <laughs> silly question number one yeah <laughs> yeah let me think about it yeah. <laughs> yeah. and he he explained that um you know he'd, he's been at some of the projects he'd got coming up he could really do with with having someone that was useful to him and the yeah. orchestra and um, also give someone this chance to be in this place and and learn, mm. and and so it was it was kind of agreed. And he said, "Look, we'll we'll make it part of the. We won't call it assistance. We'll make it part of the uh, academy. Yeah, uh, because then we won't get any um, political problems. You know, we'll we'll brush it under the carpet. Um, he paid with it for." His own money for those first um, uh, wow. years from wow. from from a, a prize he won somewhere, yeah. Copenhagen, I think, and so it was it was agreed, and it was it was it was, and um, one of the first things I had to do was prepare G Gail Friedrich Haas's "In Vain," which right. I don't know if you know that piece. No. It's, it's over an hour long, um, all of which is in microtones. Well, um, microtones tuned tuned on the sort of natural overtone series, right. um, but that need to be really precisely tuned to these chords to make it very beautiful and make the whole effect of the piece work. Plus, twenty minutes of the piece is played in pitch black, um, oh, so it needs to be memorized. <laughs> Are you telling me the answer to question six? By the way, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> And he said to me, look, I, I've been admiring this piece. I think it's a masterpiece. I want us to do it, but I haven't got the time to put this together. You can take whatever rehearsal schedule you want to create, whatever resources, whatever, you know, mm. but essentially um, rehearse this and then I will, um, you know, do it in, uh, yeah. in, in the last day or something. Um, so that was kind of test number one, and there were there were other things. I mean, the first time he threw me in front of the the orchestra, sort of big time, was uh, in Baden Baden um, for the Magic Flute, um, mm -hmm. and they I'd been rehearsing with the singers anyway. I'd done a lot of the early rehearsals with piano, and um, he threw me in there, and and some of them kind of laughed as I entered the pit and thought, who's this little boy? And yeah. um, the lovely old concert maestro that I learned to, you know, really respect. But the way he said good luck sounded like you're about to die, kid. <laughs> um, like, <laughs> and, um, but, you know, I, 
I, I didn't have time to be nervous. I knew the music really well and I just did it, you know? Yeah. And and they they played and they really responded to what I was doing and you know it went well. And and some of them started filming it on their, their phones and they sort of cheered as I left. And um well, Simon said later that when he missed a beat or something later that day, one of them shouted, Where's Duncan? <laughs> um and uh, you know, it was it was great because it was an acceptance from those wonderful players yes and it it we were creating this position as we went it didn't mean anything before it started but it began to mean that um not only would i had some nice projects with the players of the academy and uh rehearsal type opportunities with the the um big orchestra themselves i mean including like dress rehearsal of guru leader and stuff epic yeah. stuff yeah. um it also meant that the players themselves booked me for smaller ensemble stuff up to sort of Sinfonietta size. We did a Britain centenary concert with Bostridge, um, mm. all those typical pieces. We did contemporary ensemble stuff. We did chamber opera things. Um, it was really a, like, it became a very hands-on learning experience as well as the course benefit of sitting there when I could, watching the rehearsals of all the great conductors that came in and out. Of course, yeah. How much time did Simon himself, I mean, obviously, you, you know, amazing that he funded it himself. How much time did you spend, other than let, watching him rehearse, you know, picking his brains, you know, talking about early guest conducting experiences or, or you know, non-Berlin Phil stuff is what I'm getting at. You know, how much time did you have to sit down over a coffee, which I know he loves, and just chat about the world of what we do. A fair bit. I mean, as as you know, he's an extremely down to an earth, um, generous bloke, and yeah. um, he he was also clear when he had to dash off somewhere. Mm. But I was always welcome uh, in the dressing room to chat about this and that. Sometimes we had often conversations stemmed from. I'm conducting this piece for the first time. Um, have you got time to give me a few pointers or whatever? And mm. for instance, I might join him in the in the car on the way home. Um, to this day, he still doesn't drive. So yeah, he was yeah. being driven and I could uh, join him and he would remember what he could or sometimes have incredible incredible suggestions of what other famous conductors from the past had told him when he was doing it the first time mm. um or the experience he first did it in liverpool or birmingham or bournemouth or uh whatever yeah. that was um and um yeah it were, uh, real were the days when i would you know totally fire random questions to sort of ask for the biopic but from stuff we were doing there or um I was doing and therefore I would like a bit of guidance on all sorts of stories would 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 come out yeah gold dust absolute gold dust um all right, and uh, yeah that's the sort of thing that anybody would would pay the, you know pay their right arm for I know Alpresh had a similar experience with uh Andrus Nelson's when he was assistant in Birmingham you know be able to sit down and ask his opinions on things and Andrus is another one who's a a giver of time and a giver of opinions and and you know, I remember talking to Andres for about forty-five minutes over two bars of Till Spiegel with him once about how we should or shouldn't conduct it and what others in the past have done. Um, and yeah, that's there's stuff that you look back on and rely on when you go out there all on your own um, and use on a daily basis. I'm sure. Absolutely, yeah, mm. and that that, that stuff's uh, always with you, repertoire specific or not. So out into the big wide world, you'd already done guest conducting already, but you know yeah. now now you're on your own. Um, how were those early years before we get to uh, an obviously a good guest conducting experience with the South Netherlands Philharmonic because you end up being their chief from 2021 onwards? But how were those early experiences? Because I know, for instance, Barbara Hannigan once rang Simon and said, I've just had a bad experience. What do I do? And he laughed down the phone. and said, well, join the club. We've all had one of those, you know, but how, how were they? Um, 
Mixed is the yeah. honest answer. I mean, yeah. there I, were... I, fe- I, I feel for you because they were mixed for me as well. You know, they are for all of us yeah. when you're you're learning. There were um, engagements where everything seemed right and possible. I yeah. remember. Um, I remember actually. I mean, that's a great contrast example within the space of a few days. Very early on, um, uh, an invitation from Deutsche Kammer Philemy Bremen. Um, to do their New Year's Eve concert in Cologne. Right. Um, and um, it was a crazy ambitious um, uh, New Year's Eve uh, program with um, uh, Bartok Music for Strings, Percussion and Celeste. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. And some Ligeti. Yeah. And um, uh, it should have been. It should have been a crazy trumpet concerto. Who was that by? I learned it. And then the guy cancelled um, uh, my, my, my brain's failing me there, but we started with the Heinz and the Symphony, which, let's face it, too, is, is uh, you know, takes some conducting and, and ideas and whatever. Yeah. And this ensemble, it was just a total joy. I mean, yeah. phenomenal musicians, um, phenomenal chamber playing, um, really, like, sparky rehearsal process, but um, just open to everything I threw at them and very um, encouraging and um, like a, just a fantastic exchange. Exchange. Mm. It was was brilliant. And the concert went really well. And that orchestra, I've, I've been back almost every year ever since. Mm. Um, and we've done all sorts of repertoire together. And I remember the, the night uh, of that uh, Cologne concert and then party, um, very early in the morning, I should fly to Birmingham and it was going to be the first chance I had with the um first and only chance I had with the CBSO right Oxford, you know rather well rather and well indeed of, yeah of course I was um super excited about meeting this fantastic orchestra and um uh you know with all the expectations from Simon and I've recently met Andres and all the rest of it um but that was their typical new year program which was the Holker's Waltz is, yeah, yeah. Complete Strauss Fest. And, um, you know, almost no rehearsal time. Uh, and um, uh, probably not many regular players either, you know, uh, full of guests, all, all the rest of it. And um, it was just one of the occasions we, we didn't really click, you know. Yeah. Um, there were there were things I, I did, even though we had little time, want to work on. We were doing some of the more unusual lesser play lesser play um yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, strauss numbers and uh, i wanted to refine it a bit and the, the 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 energy to do that was certainly not reciprocated and the the concerts were fine there were a success and whatever but it just was not one of those um beautiful experiences of um feeling like you know it's a, you got on a house on fire with the 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 the, the, the section and there were um I, I was asked to do a lot of contemporary music with my sort of composing hat, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Often, often that went super swimmingly, um, just mixed bags. Um, well, you're of... finding you're finding your feet. I mean, you know, I, I will say in not in their defence, I will say in any conductor's defence about the Viennese concerts as the Vienna Phil do them and as most orchestras in the UK do them at some point after January the first. They are, I've done one um, because I felt I ought to do it. Uh, and I think it went very well. It wasn't with Birmingham because I think that would have been hypocritical because they knew I hated playing that stuff. So how could I stand in front of them and conduct it? Uh, I was a second violinist. Uh, and if you want to know what a second violinist does in a, in a Viennese concert, basically go outside and dig a trench for about six hours and you'll feel you'll know what it feels like. But they are the, some of the hardest things to conduct ever. They're mm. full of corners. Those waltzes are full. If you want to get the lightness of touch, the little rubatos in the little bridge passages between the waltzes to get it mm. to dance, yeah. they're so difficult. And you're never yeah. given any time to rehearse them. And it's the first thing back after Christmas for every UK orchestra. And, they're, you know, they, <laughs> there they're is an, tired. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're tired. Exactly. And so, you know, I will I will put a bracket around your Birmingham experience and say, well, they're extenuating circumstances there. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I know what, looking by your face, you know, there are some places you walk in, as you've said, I've had it. 
you think, oh, my God, within minutes, the chemistry is there. And then there are other places you walk in and think, well, what have I done? You know, I've only just started. And, they're, you know, uh, I've even had to sort of open warfare fights with principal yeah. string players. You know, you just... Exactly. Wh- why? What have I... You know? yeah. And I think it's it's just a case of the fact that you end up, if you're good enough, which, you know, you are or we are, you end up going back to orchestras many times and building a little school or a little map or a little sat nav route of every season of people you and and make diversions to new orchestras occasionally and the point being is that there are enough orchestras out there who will like you if you're good enough but there will always be some that won't and absolutely yeah, I, I had a conversation once and i know i've told this story before with a lovely gentleman called chris guy who was the principal percussion of the bournemouth symphony orchestra he was touring with us when i was a violinist and we were in japan on a train I went through about 20 to 25 conductors that we'd had as a guest conductor in Birmingham that he'd also experienced in Bournemouth. And to a man and woman, whoever we liked, they hated and vice versa. It was bizarre. you know. And, yeah. and, and that stuck with me when I started doing this and thinking, well, if you stand in, if you have one of those weeks, well, that's one of those weeks, you know, well, maybe next week will be back to, you know, however it, you, you want it to be. Um, exactly. Yeah. No, it's so true. And the other thing you you can only learn with experience is, um, you know, looking out at those faces, and we face, you know, uh, especially if it's if it's if it's lots of debuts, as it is in the beginning, it's yeah. a new group of sixty or a hundred people every week, and um, you know, sussing out their personalities and their energies, mm. and. Um, trying not to lose sleep over the ones that look like they're giving you some sort of confused evil face all the time or kind of chatting to their neighbor and you think oh god they've got it in for me or, or what it because i had the experience several times that it was those people that i felt were most uh negative towards me that came at the end of the concert and said I just wanted to say it's been really inspiring this week. I loved the way you did, you know. And you think, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, because your face you didn't look like it. Your, <laughs> yeah, work You're, on your resting bitch face. Yeah. Indeed, no. <laughs> indeed, you took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, <laughs> but to to just realise that yes, it's easily to stand there and think everybody's looking at me and um, I'm getting some funny looks and whatever, but that, that stuff can, I mean, it can be their, their natural face. It can also be what they ate for breakfast. Didn't agree with them. It can be anything personal in life. It can be that they just hate Shostakovich. It can be anything at all. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. to, To learn to just keep doing what you believe in. Yes, I do believe we should uh, respond to the energy in the room, be very alert to it in terms of the shaping of a rehearsal, in terms of how we are um, even approaching, you know, what we do physically to to get the best out of those people. But um, try and learn not to beat yourself up at every turn for, for, for at least a look yeah um or a, or a comment in the worst place and we've all had a player you know ask a shitty question or throw a curveball at us or yeah. um yeah, uh, yeah and it, create it can be one person against the the tide somebody who's as you just said having a shitty day who's decided they don't, they don't like the music they're playing maybe they're a row with their wife on the phone on the way into work and then suddenly decided, right, I'm going to make a point in this rehearsal, whereas everybody else in the room thinks, well, actually, this guy's good. Why are you having a go at him? Yeah. You know, yeah. it can be as, as simple as that. And you need to bat it off, uh, uh, or, or you know, not let it. I, I did it once. I let it get under my skin. Um, mm. uh, and yeah, it's not good for you. Not good for you at all. Let's go to positive things because one of those guest conducting things, I'm sure, was a lovely experience because it 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 ended up with you becoming the chief of the South Netherlands Philharmonic. Was it? Uh, was that a gen? What do I normally call it? Was that a love at first sight, or was that a few dates, a few meals, uh, uh, and falling in love over a, a longer period of time? It was a um, uh, a one date wonder, actually, um, and it was right. a date that wasn't meant to happen. I wouldn't call it a jump in, but it was a step in with yeah. a, a, a week's notice or something. Mm. 
and it was an orchestra I'd, I'd, I'd never heard of and uh, was 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 curious and it was quite a uh, a mixed but demanding program involving um Debussy Jeu, for instance which Ooh, tough is tough and mm. I'd had uh, a couple of experiences by that time with um orchestras who were much more famous and uh, they they'd found it very difficult we'd had to really work mm. and um I remember that's what was what we started with on that first morning and I thought wow it's quick here mm. they are super flexible they seem to get this French sound world um which some of the great German orchestras I'd conducted by that time find difficult yeah. um and I, I, also on the program, conversely, was the um, uh, Tannhäuser um, uh, Vorspiel, um, where you need to be able to make a, a, a German sound. Yeah. And that was kind of there too. I mean, and they were super quick at responding to what I, what I said and what I wanted. And there was somehow friendly atmosphere there, um, uh, smiles, jokes. Mm -hmm. um it felt just good and yeah. the 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 concerts went really well one of them was in the concert cabal um and it was only after that that i learned that actually we need to be looking for a new chief conductor mm -hmm. um and they began to to talk about that with me and um basically said if if, if you're interested we won't bother doing the search um, yeah. and you know <laughs> we won't look any further um, and it, it it just seemed a, a a good good fit and still does. I mean, the, yeah. the relationship has really flourished. It, it's been a it's been a great match in terms of um, ethos. I think in terms of atmosphere, in terms of ambition, mm. um, and I've really felt been there well two years now, and I've extended my contract um, uh, for 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 another two after I finish the third. And um, I really feel it grows from yeah. from from the weeks I'm there. Um, that we the trust is building, and the the speed at which we can tap in on what needs working um, in the and and the and the listening and the chamber music and the 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 my expectations of the color palette and the um, the sort of yeah, dramatic shape and things. It's it it it's definitely growing. Um, and growing together, which is the important thing, which is, you know, wonderful. Yeah. It's not just you learning and growing, but they're one willing to go on that journey with you, which is, you know, wonderful. Really, really good. There is an 11th question, which, you know, uh, you may or may not be aware of, which is score preparation. When you come to learn a new score, given your piano skills and your compositional skills, do you sit at the piano and, and work your way through a new score? Do you start big, go small? Do you start at the beginning and work your way through? What's your process? And much more importantly for us geeks on the, who listen to this and make this podcast, are you a red, blue, black uh, highlighter pens? Or are you hardly anything like your mentor, Sir Simon, whose scores I've seen? And, the, and you will not be gaining much in, of uh, Simon's um, insights because uh, insights, there's nothing in his score. So uh, which camp are you in? Um, I've... I've uh, shifted camps um i i started off pretty colorful actually more than red blue black right and i i i shifted to to just a soft pencil mm. um and to be honest i write less and less and less um in big contemporary scores i uh, will try and make certain things clearer sometimes i find the the tempi indications frustratingly small for yeah. the size of the print of the page um or sometimes even time signatures and if it's in a excessively multimeter you know changing all the time thing you know yeah. a bit of triangles and squares and a bit of that visual aid um certainly sometimes phrase lengths um sometimes in one of those annoying editions where the score format changes on every page and you're oh yeah not quite sure what instrument that is anymore because they've compressed it to whatever it is it's mainly one polish publishing house who had lutoswavski <laughs> on the books i loathe those scores i love yeah. his music but i hate how they those scores are put together 
Exactly. So yeah. then, yeah, there's a bit of, you know, just writing what blooming instrument it is yeah. um, to do. But, um, yeah, I, I am making less and less markings. Do I sit at the piano? Um, rarely, actually. Depends what it is. Mm. Um, normally, I'm very much just a pure score reader and, and relish being able to do that wherever actually yeah and yeah. someone who quite likes to go and sit in the sun or by the lake or or in a cafe or, or mm. whatever you know silence is good but um actually as long as I've got it you know and yeah. of course sometimes the jumping situation or the last minute cramming on a train um yeah. so yeah a lot of uh of reading I'm also not um embarrassed to say that if it's a very famous piece um, and depending on how much time I have and, um, and whatever I'm curious to check out a few recordings and absolutely usually, right yeah you know quite a range of very disparate things mm. um, like it or hate it um, just to see what people have done with it and yeah. what I agree with yeah. Yeah. and um uh, sometimes I've, you know, in in the especially in the earlier days, I felt like, well, how how do I know that I'm ready to do my first Brahms two or this opera or, or whatever, you know? And then I think, well, there is. I've listened to so many recordings. There isn't any more one that I'm totally love from the first part to the last. There are ones. Bingo! I... Hurrah! You're the first person who agrees with me. I'm doing Shostakovich eight in two weeks' time with the CBSO. And I, the other day, I listened to four recordings back to back. Oh no, they were YouTube performances as well. Yeah. And now that must take me into the 15, 16, 17 area. There now does not exist a recording that but you totally that, agree with. That's yeah. in my head. There are bits of up people's yeah. recordings go, yes, that's the one. And yeah. other places, you know, I watched one the other day, and I shan't say who it was, and I swore at my laptop. And what the yeah. bloody hell are you doing? You know. Yeah. Uh, why yeah you exactly know? why exactly. yeah 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 oh and, and my uh, missus hates watching codswells will be on the television because i will shout why at the television <laughs> but no i thank you for saying that because i think that really when you've got a score in your head when you know the structure when you know the balance when you know uh, everything about it the how fast the tempi should go they just uh, there isn't a recording there there just doesn't exactly. exist yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, which means you know you've got it in there and you also know you've probably not been influenced by too many others but you have yeah. at least listened to them because i think you exactly you'd you be arrogant to, not to really exactly i think so i mm. totally totally agree and and then you know you also you're therefore very confident about what you want to get out of that orchestra and let's yeah. say it's a very famous orchestra and they have a history of playing that piece well you are sure you know uh yeah where where you're going to take them with it and mm. and yeah i think that's that's really important occasionally for um for opera somehow i find myself a bit more at the the, the piano with the score mm. under my fingers maybe it's about the the time scale thing maybe it's maybe it's that i know ultimately although uh, in the in the great houses there's always going to be a, a a pianist coach to play for you if you wanted to um do something with a singer some at times i mean i've had experiences at Glyndebourne or, or frankly even even at the Met where it was really quite nice um to just sit the two of you with a singer in a room mm. um and then not be this massive team of people there are as you as you work in uh opera and just have that intimate thing of Let's let's explore this. Okay, that's where you want to drift. Well, can I persuade you that we go a bit in this direction? Mm. Um, this I find super helpful. Um, but I'm not someone who sits there and, um, you know, to a show off extent, you know, plays the score reads. Um, I did do a bit of that at uni. Um, I probably could still do it, but it, it doesn't turn me on that much. And I no. find much more useful the the reading and the studying and the imagining in my head. Um, what I want. Are you a young conductor, thirsty for knowledge, and wanting to discover more about the conducting world? Then my Patreon page is there for you. I am constantly posting new content there based on my experiences as a conductor and as an ex-orchestral player, and I offer you the chance to ask me any question, any time of the day. For instance, you might like to ask me how to mark up a score, as we've just been discussing. 
When you subscribe, you will gain access to interviews, video posts, tour diaries, articles, and much more. If you pay for the whole year, then you will gain a 10% discount. And if you're a student, contact me directly and there will be a further discount. All of this can be found at patreon.com forward slash a mic on the podium. And from just £5 a month, you can gain access to this ever-growing resource on conductors and conducting. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com. Details and links to the page are in the show notes attached to this episode. Now, the all-important 10 questions with my guest... Duncan Ward. Duncan, it is that time of the podcast where we must traverse the fabled 10 questions. And I start with what sound or noise do you love and what sound or noise do you hate? Sound or noise I love. I've gone for um, the wake up call of a cockerel. And Ooh. the the, uh, um, the reason for that is... Um, I mean, I'm a bit of a, well, absolute nature loving fanatic, but um, shortly before the pandemic, my parents moved from our little place in Kent um, to the middle of the uh, well, mid North Welsh hills, um, oh. totally isolated, and started a little sort of self sufficient farm set up. We have yeah. goats and chickens and, and cockles and uh, pigs and, and uh, all the rest of it. And they grow the vegetables and they grow the uh, fruits and all the rest of it. And for me, um, that's one of the paradise place I escaped to. It's where I spent the first uh, four months of the lockdown actually just getting uh, in with helping them on the farm with the animals, digging in the manure, um, whatever it was. And it's the it's the place that I sleep the best in the world. Um, And so to know that I've had this heavenly fresh air fueled uh, sleep and that you know, that's going to be broken by the the, the, the sound of the cockerel in the morning is a, is a beautiful thing. I also, um, as I sort of travel around, which seems to be a um, perpetual thing, um, I, I've, 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 I've become aware that every every language has such a different um, way of of, the, of writing the sound or describing the sound that the cockerel makes. Right. And of which, frankly, the English cock-a-doodle-doos is the most <laughs> ridiculous. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's really not like that at all. But no. from, I think, cuckoo-cuckoo and kikariki and cock-a-cock-a-co. And, I mean, really, like, yeah. I, I, I even I Googled it. I mean, the, the list of how you describe this animal noise is, is yeah. quite extensive. So I find that quite fun. Brilliant answer, which I know I've not had before. And a sound that you loathe, despise, hate, dislike intensely? So it's a bit related, um, and, and that's my alarm clock. Um, right. And <laughs> uh that's that I, i've changed it I, I i'm afraid i'm one of the you know masses that use the phone as the alarm clock and i've tried Me most too. of them and all of them i hate um it's that dread feeling of i almost certainly haven't had enough sleep and i i need to get going um i started choosing uh, i mean somebody suggested but what about picking a song you love you know what about it i don't know it's Lionel Richie or or whatever you know some but you quickly get fed up for that too at the yes. moment I've got a Bruckner motet um uh, locus iste um which wakes me up very very uh peacefully and a cappella and and all the rest of it and very dreamy it I I, I liked it better for a little bit and now I hate it too I mean it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah alarm clocks zero alarm clocks if you had 24 hours free what would you spend it doing it would actually also be um, um, magically transporting myself to this uh, family farm in, in, in yeah. Wales. It's It's been one of the joys of these last few years um, and feels such a natural home. Um, I love, especially if, I mean, I now have, 11 nieces and nephews um and if, if some of them are there too and there's them to play with as well as uh milking the goats and making the goat's cheese and uh looking after the animals and picking blackberries together and all the rest of it that's that's really magical there's a there's a there's a river just down the hill to go and swim in and walking or running in the hills is is, is fantastic food is extremely important there Mm. um we we built uh earlier this year a, a big outdoor stone pizza oven but it's fantastic also for like um slow slow roasting uh 
shoulder of pork or or lamb and you know the meat is then divine when it's so soft yeah. and juicy and crispy on the outside and this sort of winding black the clock to simple living of um slow cooking making their bread from scratch um sitting just in total silence apart from bird song overlooking the view of the valley with a nice glass of wine um this for me is uh is is heavenly there are two things that come from that have just popped into my mind and, and one of them is a regular occurrence which is dear listener as you can well imagine i'm now looking forward to the answer to question 10 because duncan's obviously into his food which is good not all conductors are duncan some of them really aren't into their food but the second thing and this is a really important thing for me is that do you know what I've realized right now today I could have written a completely different question three. I could have written, how do we how do you well what process do you find the best way of emptying your mind of the job that we do and of and of music and of you know the helter skelter running around the world? Because that's what we I think most of us, most of the answers to that question have been some way or other of emptying the mind. You know, whether it's yeah. somebody says, I'd love to go for a jog or I love to go hiking in the forests or I like to go on a boat trip or I've had them all, as you can imagine. But actually, what we all end up doing is just emptying our minds of, of what we've been doing the previous week or, the, or what we've got coming up the next day or whatever it is. And I think that's what exactly what you've just described. You know, I would imagine there comes a point when the musical soundtrack of your brain has been switched off when you go to North Wales. And that's what we're after, isn't it, really? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's the switch, switch off. It's the coming down to earth as well, because yeah. um, as as kind of frenetic as the whole sort of airport chaos and whatever can be, lots of people stereotype at least it's a sort of glitzy and glamour of a concert hall and a glass of champagne and a dinner and a, a this and that. And actually, poof, um, it's rarely like that. <laughs> even, st even, even staying in a you know, super luxury hotel it really gets <laughs> tiring quickly, you know, and, yeah. and the coming back to what is life really about, actually, and mm. uh, breathing a breath of fresh air and being with family and uh, having some peace and quiet. And, and as you say, switching off, winding down, refreshing mm. and being refueled and uh, re-inspired by nature itself, uh, I yeah. think it's really important. Well, I'm sorry to wrestle you back into our world of conducting with question four. Can you name your favourite conductor or conductors of yesteryear? So I um, I haven't listened to all the episodes, but I imagine you've had a lot of Clive. So I'm not going to go there, even though I love him dear. Um, You're correct, um, by the way, of, of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I um, I'm not someone who pours obsessively over uh, old masters or uh, old recordings. But um, sometimes repertoire specific, mm. I've been very curious to go to, for instance, I mean, actually, we last met at Sibelius to the earliest recording we know uh, with with Kayanos. Yes. And and Simon put me onto that one, actually. And I, it blew my mind just how different a million miles that is from. I mean, I grew up with the sort of um LSO Colin Davis, English Sibelius, sort of beautiful. I loved it. Very mm. warm, very sort of noble. But this is something else. It's it's electric. It's super fast. Yeah. Uh, the double basses at the beginning of the second movement. Um, da, 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 da. Whoa. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and even the beginning. And it's got this drive and this momentum, which I then really researched into of um, what were like the impressions um from the premiere of those symphony or the early performances and and um people didn't comment on oh what a relaxing joy through nature or whatever yeah. they were like wow this sounds like a angry piece of protest and there's this um like drama and tension from the first note to the last that yeah. just grows and grows and grows and a, a sort of different, yeah. completely different concept of sound and this early Finnish way of playing and quite distinctive woodwind playing. And, I mean, I learned so much from listening to that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I found that very inspiring. And it, it's not that um, he would be my hero conductor or something. It's that that was a, a moment of, aha, okay, yeah. not all of that I need to copy uh, or would 
agree with now, but there's something there that is, you know, really changed my mind about how I do that piece. Um, and similarly, if I'm allowed one more would be, of course, when I'm doing uh, Jan Acek, um, listening back to um, Karel uh, Anchel. Yes. Um, uh, again, this uh, uh, quite special Czech sound, I think, um, from early 60s or whenever it was that the recording's from, uh, listening to like Taras Bulba mm. um, and this kind of steely um, string sound and this very precise and rhythmic um, drive in the brass, but that is a world away from like massive fat Chicago symphony yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's another sound and this uh, like oboe and cor anglais solos with loads of vibrato oh. and um, quite sort of angular. Um, again, I, I, it's a piece I adore. Um, and uh, again, it's a piece I first did in the NYO under Colin Davis. Um, and this completely took me in another another way. Yeah. Two pieces I adore, yet two recordings I don't think I've ever listened to. So you've got me onto those, which is great. And actually, I don't think either conductor has been mentioned on the podcast before. Even the Finns, and I've interviewed, I don't know, eight or nine Finns. I'm not sure anybody said Kayanus, who, who was, you know, the founding father of Finnish conducting, really, yeah. Um, yeah. With, through his experiences premiering Sibelius. So brilliant answers. I wonder whether number five is going to be the obvious answer, uh, given your association with one particular conductor. But who would be your favourite current conductor or conductors? Yeah, I, I can't help but say I admire him hugely. I mean, mm. uh, I think uh, Simon Rattle, though I, um, you know, uh, there are moments uh, in, in certain pieces, I think, oh, no, that's not how I do it, but it works fantastically. And mm. the what I love most about it is his um uh his spirit his his way with people his way of um uh you know bringing young people old people top of the profession people whatever people together behind this amazing thing we do um mm. and uh he's incredibly inspiring um in, in a rehearsal i love also his you know continuing curiosity he's not a um uh master conductor that has sat back and gone around the world doing the same old 10 pieces no. far from it you know mm. there are clear um favorite things in his repertoire but every year he has discovered um some new new curious things um and he is championing them and that's new music and it's old music and i think that's just super super healthy and and exactly what um the sort of ethos of music making I I, I agree with. Um, the other conductor I would choose, and there are many conductors I, I admire um, for all sorts of different reasons, would be uh, François Xavier Roth. Mm. And again, there are things when I listen to him in uh, a concert on a few occasions or, or, or on recordings, and I think, really? Woo! Uh, but it's never going to be boring. I've no. never sent me to sleep. Um, I, I sense he, and I, I, I know him a bit personally too, has thought so carefully about every bar of that music and how it should go, in his opinion, mm. and has masterfully worked on it uh, with whatever ensemble it is. And I know him best with Le Siecle, who I admire enormously and had the chance to work with recently, or or Gürtznich, likewise. Mm. Um and the the way he really um, uh, shapes a sound and shapes a performance to exactly the way he wants um, in his very particular conducting style, which again is a, a million miles from my own, um, but is I, I know that I'm going to be fascinated if I if, if I go, and, yeah. and I think that's a um, a great quality. Again, um, a, amazing choices of, of of repertoire, both both unusual, often unusual pairings. Um, something very, very famous, um, Bruckner, Schumann, whatever it is, um, with something off the wall, yeah. um, both of which he will tell in an equally um, persuasive way. 
You mentioned a piece earlier on, which had was full of microtones and quarter tones and various other tones that do or don't exist. I wonder whether it was the hardest work you've ever conducted. Um, it would be certainly on the list for um, uh, hardest to prepare, to learn, and <laughs> yeah. to um, rehearse, to, rehearse. And yeah, yeah, to yeah. persuade a group of people that they want to do this. Because mm. really, you tear your hair out tuning these chords. And to my sins, I suppose, um, having done it so well in Berlin, when he then wanted to do it with his new band in Munich, um, <laughs> <laughs> they also came knocking. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was on duty there. I, I haven't chosen that no. one. Um, I've chosen, uh, um, uh, again, a bit off the wall, um, but it was an experience I had in uh, Toulouse um, conducting Shostakovich's only ever uh, silent movie score that he wrote the full thing uh, a piece called The the New Babylon which is um, black and white obviously um, 90 minutes long yeah. and um, the, the snag is that um, there's no um, there's no help I mean and I know you've done film things or, or, or these sorts of things you know often you have the time code in the score and you have and, uh, a, and a screen you, with you know, a time and code a, running on screen. it yeah yeah, yeah. It's not at all mm. um uh let alone i mean once i had to do a film thing and there was a click track oh. this I, mm. I had to learn 90 minutes of extremely complicated virtuosic uh shostakovich with a lot of extremely fast tempi um, and whatever, but I also had to learn by heart 90 minutes of black and white film, <laughs> film yeah, and yeah. how I would imagine it should sink. Mm. Um, and and then, I mean, okay, you could slightly be out of kilter maybe, but um, there were clearly hit points that you had yeah. to absolutely nail. And there was a moment where they all stood up and sang the Marseillaise, and that should be there too. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you, you cannot is, afford to drift 30 seconds behind because you know the Marseillaise is coming in two and a half minutes' time. Exactly. How do you dump 30 seconds of Shostakovich? You don't. So you, and the, you, you've got these waypoints all the way through thinking, right, I've hit that one. Good. I'm now still on track. Oh, my God, I was about five seconds behind that one. I've now got to push the next one and maybe, you know, get my five seconds back. Oh, mental math. The, yeah. the thing in... Uh, rehearsing that again you know just as not every orchestra wants to do the viennese gig um you know lots of orchestral musicians see the film thing on the on the title and they think oh yeah okay well a few days of this whatever whatever that is you know this will be fine yeah and they and they were like oh no yeah <laughs> ah there's another hundred pages of this you know yeah and it's 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 Shostakovich, you know. It's it's not Ligeti. It it had to be right, you know. Mm. It was lots of it was virtuosically incredibly fast tempi, but you know, very obvious if it was wrong. And mm. um, it was sort of naked harmonically like Mozart. I mean, it needed to be in tune. It needed to be together. I had to keep the flipping thing in sync, which was almost <laughs> impossible. Yeah. Um, in the concert, I did actually drift um, a bit. I took the wrong. A uh, gamble in my tired state and was slipping behind and got further oh, and had to motor through another bit, you know, to hit the Marseillaise. And oh, you know, it, it, it was really, I mean, I was drenched at the end. I was so sweaty. And I just remember reaching that final bar line and the players looking behind and going, Oh my God, yeah. it says the end on the screen. <laughs> and, I mean, before yeah. the audience clapped, I think the orchestra were just like, what yeah. you know? Yeah, we did it. Yeah, <laughs> we did it. Uh, so yeah, that was really. Uh, it, I haven't had many experiences quite like. Of course, many different sorts of challenging conducting experiences, but that sticks with me as a as as a nightmare. And I did go and see one conductor who had done it before, and that was um, Vladimir Yurovsky. Um, and I, I just went to chat to him and said, you know, what, what, had he found any solutions? And he looked at me and he said. Oh <laughs> yes, <laughs> this this is the hardest thing I ever had to do here too. Uh, yeah. Like you know, uh, just just good luck. You know, good luck. Do, uh, yeah. do your homework. So, if the phone rang tomorrow, would you say yes or no? No, I would say no. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I, <laughs> it I scarred kept, you, right? I, <laughs> I, I kept my score with, right. you know, like... Oh, you need to um, you need your, your own markings in that. Yeah, man, God. Man, yeah. man kisses woman, the dog runs across yeah. the thing. I think, yeah. you know, it's raining, you know, yeah. all this sort of stuff, you know. Uh, talk about marking up a score, but I don't think I would bother doing it again. No, yeah. fair Sadly. enough. <laughs> when travelling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? So um, it is a bit weird, but um, there's a thing that's always sculling around in the bottom of my suitcase, and that's this, um, uh, like, red rubber um, flexi band strip thing. Um, and it's it's something I picked up in uh, having seen a physio in Palermo. I mean, uh, there was a time of going around conducting, getting really injured quite a lot or not mm. injured but like in serious pain shoulders arms um back stuff whatever you know and i was often going to osteos or physios for emergency touch-ups before a gig and um it it seems often that there was a problem in the rotator cuffs uh right. just underneath the um shoulders yeah and um this guy showed me some exercises i could do with this piece of rubber mm. um very small movements, but that targeted specifically the 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 sort of hard to get to muscles that I was persistently destroying, mm. um, and it completely changed everything. I've stuck to it since, you know. I have gone through phases of, of you know running and and whatever, but um, if I've got zero time in the morning, uh, a tiny stretch. And a couple of these um, uh, simple exercises before I start with this dodgy looking red band that has um, sculled around in my suitcase getting dusty for the last seven years um, really helps uh, me not get too badly hurt in the course of the conducting day. So that's something I, I do not go without. Brilliant answer. Uh, the listener would not know this but you know i put this episode or interview back by one hour via email because i finally got in to see my osteopath because i've got a bit of tennis elbow going going on at the moment which is linked to your shoulder and your neck and i think came about through an excessive amount of thrashing around with some a youth orchestra recently but yeah we need to look after ourselves and that sounds brilliant we all have our own you know whether it be a tennis ball that you rub on your between your back and the wall or whatever it is we all need something yeah. So that's brilliant, and and our you know our we don't have a violin to hide behind. Our no. our, our instrument is our body, and um, we need to be able to use it, and um, perhaps more so than any other profession, um, if we take some sort of care about it. And if anyone's still interested in what we have musically to say in fifty years, um, we we could keep you know exactly. subtly waving our arms on a podium until we dropped it so i i look at herbert I, blomstadt he's still going exactly, at 95 yeah. 96 amazing. whatever it is amazing number eight what is the one thing you would change about being a conductor and um, in in brackets when you sent me this um question was uh, it could be real or it could be fantasy Correct. and i yeah. thought that that might be um quite a, a, a way to go with this because i thought I've picked up or studied a bit, um, a bit of lots of languages as I've gone around um, yeah. and uh, consulted we do. It by yeah. Yeah. In a bit of German and French a bit more, maybe some Italian, maybe even some Japanese that I did at school. Um, but I don't speak any of them fantastically fluently. And I thought, what if your baton really was magic in Harry Potter fashion? And it could be... a, a um, a, a wand translator mm. and what you wanted to say at that moment in the orchestra came out beautifully in the language of that they actually speak and this for me would change so much because um, of course we should do as much as we can through just gesture but there are always going to be I mean at least you need to tell them what bar number we're going to start from exactly. um, and uh, there are going to be stylistic things or interpretation things or certain things that you need to clear up and 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 ask people for and i would it would for me i think um reduce some of that stress of the traveling thing um to know that i could express myself in my own language poetically as i liked and somebody would understand it totally fluently i mean i'm about to do uh, peter grimes again 
for the first time in 10 years. And the last time was the, the Chinese premiere in Beijing. And right. there they definitely did not understand a word I said. Um, right. Things sort of seemed to get better as we rehearsed them. But I realised when we went, got back to like bar one and went through again that nothing had changed. And I thought, right. oh, no. And then I got the, the question on... Um, uh, I think just after the dress rehearsal, and they dared to come and ask. And two two little violins came, violinists came t- together uh, for sort of moral support. And they said, um, uh, "Is it is it true you're a member of the royal family?" And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> "Oh God, like <laughs> we have missed each other completely yeah. this week." Yeah. Um, yeah. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, a, a, a magic translating baton, I think, would make quite a difference in the role of a, a conductor. Well, I'm going to mix up the literary metaphors here and say, I think it's a brilliant idea, but you would need, is it called the Babel fish from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? It's a little fish that you would need in the your receiver, ear. true. You'd need the yeah. receiver to understand what That's they would say true. back to you. So but maybe, if, maybe if it came with a free Babel fish or Babel fish or whatever it is, then then you would buy one. Yeah, exactly. I'd buy one instantly. <laughs> but, but, yeah. But maybe the, the, the cork end or something, you could, you know, because the other end would be a bit spiky. But if you yeah. held that then to your ear, maybe you could get yeah, the receiving get, end. Get, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, number nine. And again, dear listener, in brackets afterwards, it says real or fantasy. So I'm excited to see what this is going to be. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt or have liked to have attempted? This is probably a bit a bit more boring, but um, uh, photography is one of the things that I just love to do um and and kind of do in parallel uh i mean never professionally but um as i travel around i'm always uh taking photos of interesting things i see whether it's on the phone or with my uh, big camera um if i can um lug it around that week um or weeks and um that could be nature photography which frankly is my favorite um either uh, really in close or interesting lighting or um uh landscape things or animal things um but also cityscape things um mm. uh which let's face it is are, are places we 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 often visit um spend a lot of our also, time yeah yeah um also frankly sometimes uh portrait things the 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 beauty of um taking photos of people especially people that don't like to be photographed Mm. and finding ways to whether it's a family member or a loved one or whatever um uh, catching them off guard but in their true essence and uh you know making something that they don't hate um I, i i love to do too so yeah it would be it would be um uh photography and finally if the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? <laughs> it's a good question, and it's tricky because I'm a huge uh, foodie and and love to go to restaurants and cook myself. And um, one of the weird accidents that's happened since I lived in um, uh, Cologne um, has been uh, befriending uh, a few um, Michelin star chefs. And um, one of them uh, happens to be an extraordinary uh, musician as well, um, Daniel Gottschlich. He's one of um, actually Germany's most famous chefs. He's often on the television and things. He has a a phenomenal two-star restaurant uh, in Cologne, Oxenclay, um, but is not that much older than me and um, a super, super, super nice guy. And through uh, friends um, somehow... Uh, that's become a bit of a um, sort of dinner party club at, 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 in my flat. Um, and we, you know, there's a balcony overlooking the Rhine and um, there's a, a bit of space and there's a nice piano and music happens and sometimes dancing. And uh, I'm very obsessive about um, uh, collecting and storing wines. So I have a big wine fridge. And um, it, it, it wouldn't be the first time that he has um, said, well, I'd love to try out some new ideas for the, the the restaurant. You know, can we get some people together again? And you know, yeah. we'll, we'll 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 cook together. And this has turned into like a improv, incredible fifteen courses of 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 whatever that we're we're, we're sampling <laughs> and assessing whilst emptying the contents of um, beautiful things in the wine fridge. Or frankly, uh, you know, it's it's about um, trialing a, a whole new 
range of wines that he's just got in from yeah. Slovenia or something that he's interested in. So this um, this kind of cooking at a crazily high level, but uh, intimately for mm. friends, with friends, as part of a, um, a chilled, happy, fun evening has been one of the amazing things of my last uh, few years since living in Cologne. So if, if the world really was going to end, it would be... Um, to invite him over and some of my best friends and uh yeah have a have an evening like that wow what a brilliant answer uh absolutely wonderful answer and a name i didn't know about and i've been to cologne quite a lot in the last four or five years and i'm going three times next year um so i will find out the name of the restaurant and maybe you and i should check go it out this restaurant together Let's uh, go if you're together. there yeah absolutely so he now has he now has two, and one of them is really close to where you'll be working uh, in the in, in the funk house. Um, he has a, like uh, it's meant to be more relaxed. It's still quite hard to get in, uh, but the a, a, a sort of cocktail bar called Pulse, and mm. there it's um, little sharing plates. But the food is also out of this world good, and uh, it's that's that's the that's the place to go if you can't manage the months ahead reservation for the the two starry place. Yeah. Well, it's a date. We're doing it. I will let I will let you know when I'm there, and we'll we, hopefully we'll just carry on chatting like we've been doing. It's been a wonderful hour and a half or so chatting with you, Duncan. I've had a great time, and as I said, I'm there three times in 2024, and uh, I hope to see you there. And, and hopefully, our diaries will be in Cologne at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's really, really good to uh, chat with an interviewer who knows what we are doing so intimately and asks pertinent and uh, good humoured uh, questions about you know, what it is we're all up to. Um, it's been huge pleasure and I look forward to chatting further. Thank you. A mic on the podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I chat with a Mexican conductor who came from a musical family, but initially at least did not study music. He has held title positions in the United States and Mexico, and just this last summer, he appeared at the BBC Proms conducting the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain. But until then, bye-bye.